start, you know, I, I had my first startup, you know, we were talking about this actually just before the pandemic, it was the 20th anniversary since I launched Ajib.com, which was an online translation engine way before Google, uh, you know, made it uh, standard. You know, my idea was to have a, a, an online filter where all the Arab internet users can read uh, the online English content in Arabic and therefore it will break the language barrier and allow people to uh, surf the web uh, without having any language problems. Um, I launched Ajib out of Dubai Internet City 20 years ago and um, you know uh, there was one or two other startups that are still around. Bait.com you know, that was, they were my neighbors in, in that building. And that's when I got to meet some of the founders of that company who now became venture capitalists and operators themselves. So, um, yeah, two decades of being in, this, in, the, in the zone, you know, gave me some of the, you know, reasons that, 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 that based on my conviction on, on what I'm doing now, and why I'm doing it the way I am. So, I mean, today I, I want to dig in on, on certain uh, points with you because if we take uh, our region we like uh, headlines we like uh, to be promoted even if there might not be nothing uh, behind it but more importantly uh, how do we measure uh, the success of an ecosystem of the VC ecosystem is it the rounds being raised is it the exit is it seeing companies growing new companies being launched what is a good indicator in your view that we're moving on the right steps with this ecosystem in the region okay well um you know everyone has the point of view i'm going to give you my point of view on what is successful and what is not and what's an indication of, of a healthy ecosystem and 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 what is unhealthy in this uh ecosystem so um i think finally exits, you know, is, you know, the final exit is, is, is the indication of a success. You know, when you, you know, the germination all the way to the IPO is the, the journey and the successful journey ends with a successful exit. That is what they teach us. That is what we look forward to. That's when we look at the market and talk about the great tech companies, they all exited successfully. You know, the FANG and the Facebook and Alphabet, Microsoft, Netflix, Google, and, Apple and, and, and you know, and, and, and even others, Salesforce, etc., and Uber, they all have great exits, right? So the exit, in theory, is a very successful IPO. Now, there aren't any in the region because there's not one exit in those terms in the region because, A, there is no public market, okay, or financial capital market in the region that allows for public listings of companies that are not profitable okay so the whole you know um idea of, of of listing a company that isn't profitable is still not acceptable by the the regulators of the capital market capital markets regionally now as of recently tadawul in saudi is considering doing something that's friendly uh, to startups, which allows companies to list within parameters that are, don't include profitability. But for example, like to list in a market like Kuwait, you need, you know, three years of profitability. You need other, you know, other metrics that people consider are necessary for a, a winning uh, company. I think they're old ideas and I think these are obsolete ideas actually, you know, like Amazon only made profitability 2015 it's one and a half trillion dollar company so it's either you know the guys who are doing the amazon ipos are crazy in the eyes of the local people here who are trading in the public markets or we're just very much delayed and un, un, unaware of the developments of the ipo markets and how exits should happen you know the ideas that are forced now on companies here to be eligible for a public offering are obsolete. They're just old and the capital market authorities of, of the different countries here and the different regulators need, need to update their, their game, need to get on with it, really. 
So in that sense, there are no exits and there are no IPOs. So maybe it doesn't seem so successful. However, when we look at companies that did exit and the other part of the exit, the non-IPO part is the acquisition being acquired by a bigger company and being acquired by a preferably a public company. And so that is the other shortcut that people might be able to take if you can't go a direct path to uh, profitability through an IPO. And so we look at the, the, the successful companies that do come out of the Middle East, that have came out of the Middle East and that do um, qualify as a success, whether it's Kareem was an acquisition by Uber, which is a public company now, you know, uh, Balabat and Carriage out of Kuwait, you know, the Delivery Hero, it's a public German company. Um, you know, back in the days, Mektub went public with Yahoo, which is a public company. And so that is sort of an indirect way to a successful, uh, a successful exit. So yes, their markets are not made yet and ready for a public offering, but some of the successful companies here did figure out how to get an exit you know, and that is what keeps every young and, and maybe not so young people like me who are investing in, in tech uh, hopeful that there's an exit. Yeah, I, I just want to, to, to pick up on that point because now that, you know, Amazon opened in the region uh, by acquiring uh, Soup.com and now they've been buying out uh, much earlier stage startups and disrupting maybe other startups that are in the sector and putting them at really big risk. So in this race with time, that now that the market, we are opening up to our local entrepreneurs, but also to international companies to come and establish. Do you think that there should be some type of protection or, or some type of government measures to help these startups grow a little bit more and to reach these level that you're mentioning where it's a nice exit. It's, a, it's not an early stage uh, exit that, that doesn't, you know, really impact the ecosystem. Well, look, it's, it, it, every exit, you know, is, 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 uh, is a success in some sort of way. You know, if it's a positive and it's, you know, uh, you know with, a, with, a, with, a, with a nice markup and a multiple for the early investors, it's a success. It doesn't have to be a thousand X. And it doesn't have to be a grandiose, you know, uh, flamboyant IPO. You know, if you look at a lot of other companies, even in the U.S., you know, WhatsApp and Instagram, both were not IPOs and both were successful exits, right? So um, it doesn't necessarily need to be an IPO for it to be successful. However, I hear you and what you mean by saying, um, why are companies not reaching their potential and why do they have to sell earlier than they should because of shortcomings in the ecosystem? I believe that's what you mean. And for now, I guess that's true. And I guess that is a, a, you know, a hindering uh, sort of reality, but uh, it paves the way for uh, more companies and more startups to get excited. Look, if, if Amazon is gonna come buy your startup, you know, you're gonna be very happy because you're gonna get paid that Amazon shares which is better than cash today you know the growth in amazon over the past year definitely beats any other asset class whether it's you know whatever whatever you're into and so um that, that and that should also encourage governments to be more supportive of the of, of the ecosystem because now we're watching companies and uh, come and buy buy some of the earlier you know startups out whether it's an aqua hire because they need the team to 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 uh, execute and operate or whether they need the specific technology uh, that, that has been developed. And um, all, all big companies grow through acquisitions anyway. So it's a good sign when a company like Amazon does come here and start buying companies out because it, it, it indicates that there's local talent and local know-how that they're missing, which is required, which should incentivize a lot of startups to, uh, to look forward to that at least. So to go back to your point about governments, I mean, we see governments, there, there are a lot of initiatives being done by uh, government. In your view, where should these efforts be focused? For example, do you think that government should invest directly into startup or is it better to do what, the trend that we're seeing, which is uh, funds, giving money to funds on funds and being LP in the fund of fund? 
that creates the ecosystem and that also creates the investor base and uh, and and works on it in your view where where should a government uh, position uh, itself today in terms of encouraging and building this ecosystem um <clears throat> That's a very good question, and it's very, you know, there's many things we can say about it here, but I'm going to start with, 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 you know, where should the money go first? You know, if we look at the U.S. private equity game, you know, private equity really started in the U.S. right, right around the 20s and 30s, you know, where, you know, the big, big billionaires back then started, you know, investing in, 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 in startups. To help them, you know, get over, you know, technology was new, electricity and all that, and the motor, you know, the engine and the locomotive was allowing people to get closer. And so private equity started then, and it was really rich people funding startups. Now, um, fast forward to the 50s, you know, where the government started something called the uh, Small Business uh, Investment uh, Act, I think, where uh, SBICs were created which is, you know, small business investment um, company. And, you know, that allowed licenses to, you know, that li licensed and regulated the whole private equity game. And then fast forward to the 70s, you had the big players now come in the game, you know, the Kleiner Perkins and Sequoia, and they're all like engineers from, you know, hardware and, and, and companies that really wanted to invest. And that's why the first check came into the companies like Apple and others. And then, you know, the whole, you know, and then Silicon Valley started. So in a nutshell, what I'm trying to say here is that what wasn't the government it was more the big money and the big corporates, you know, that were back then, you know, that they had face, uh, you know, they had a hero, you know, that's, you know, uh, Rockefeller this or Mellon that or, or, you know, Vanderbilt or DuPont, and, you know, those guys, the first guys that started writing checks. So here, you know, those are the governments now. You know, the governments are the biggest checks in the region, you know, because of, you know, the, 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 you know they control the whole petrochemical and hydrocarbon industry, whatever. So the wealth by the governments is, you know, beyond any, any other wealthy individual here. And so the government should be that person that invests in these funds. Now, the way to do it, I think, is the smart way is to do a fund of funds because there's no way... The government can sit there and read business plans and go through strategies and figure it out. It's just, you know, too micro. They shouldn't do that. You know, and I think now it's, it's, this is what they're doing, and they're doing it smartly. You know, Bahrain has the Waha Fund, which is a fund of funds. You know, they, they're, they're, I think, geographically uh, neutral and agnostic. They, 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 they focus on MENA, right? You have to have a MENA strategy where they can attract some of the companies to launch in Bahrain. Um, you know, Mubadala launched a regional fund of funds. Uh, Saudi Arabia has a, a, a Saudi fund of funds that can help you. And I think, you know, that is the first stop for uh, the emerging managers who are going to set up these funds uh, and act as angel investors and act as seed investors. And that is really the foundation of the ecosystem. And that we don't have yet. We don't have like 200 well-known angel investors that have seeded three or four startups that have exited, you know, and so you don't know what a successful angel is in the Middle East, right? And that's the first thing, you know, from germination requires seed checks. So you need a seed investor and the an angel investor. So I think ideally what we're going to see now is, and, uh, you know, once the capital is there and you can see the governments have allocated fund of funds, now that should encourage and entice angel investors to go and set up micro funds. You don't have to have a 30 or 40 or $50 million fund. Go do a $5 million fund. Go do a $7 million, $10 million fund and focus on a niche. I want to do regional fintech. I want to do Islamic fintech. I want to do, you know, uh, health data analytics. I want to do, uh, you know, last mile edu edutech, prop tech, you know, and be focused on it. And, uh, you know, and these fund of funds should, should provide the first checks in and should do the due diligence so that family offices and other ultra high net worth groups, investment companies, and lastly, corporate venture can also come in and follow on that investment. So I think I want that- to, I, I want to follow up on what you just mentioned. We received a, 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 a question. And so do you believe that we have too many regional VCs following a small narrow pool or vice versa? And if the answer is yes, 
then what can the private sector do to enhance the ecosystem? So do you think that there's already, uh, somebody's asking is if you think that there's already too many regional VCs chasing a limited number of, of, uh, yeah. of deals? Yeah, well, look, um, that's not true. Okay, there's never enough money to be poured into any, uh, you know, venture. This is not real estate, you know, you can't just build buildings and figure out, you know, there's an oversupply and over demand. You know, IP, intellectual property, there's never an oversupply of ideas, right? Ideation needs money. You know, creativity needs money. You know, being but do we have critical. enough creativity? This is what I think the question means. Yeah, yeah. Is like, do we have enough creativity? Do we have enough true ideas, new innovative ideas that are being made? More than, I mean, I tell you something. Yeah. Uh, we, we, I, I, I chose, I, a, we chose a, a provocative, provocative title around fake entrepreneurs but sometimes i feel that these even these government programs we're basically financing uh, youngsters to go and drink coffee in in nice uh, uh, offices and play ping pong where 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 do we say if we compare to other uh, countries in the region you know what how do you how do you evaluate that how do you value the innovation of all these companies even if we have amazon coming up and buying earlier and it's a, a positive sign, but it, it, do you have in mind, let's say, three to five new startups in the region with brilliant, innovative uh, ideas? Yeah, look, um, you asked like 17 questions in one statement, but let me, <laughs> let me try to like get, get back to, to certain points. First of all, there's never enough money poured into intellectual property and ideation of things people need, right? You need to uh, figure out what people need. You don't know what people need. You know, there's, there's challenges every day. Like the COVID pandemic came and made you realize how much you don't know about what you actually need, right? So like we need a lot of things and a lot of things need to be enhanced and developed and invented, right? For us to move forward. Right, especially now with 5G, blockchain, augmented reality, IoT, AI, you know, data mining, data analytics. We don't even know. We're not even at 1% of all of that. So no, of course, there's never enough uh, ideas to solve problems that we need. You know, we need, we need a lot of stuff. And, you know, yes, you, you know, you and I are still young, but the young youngsters, the 20-year-olds, they're the ones still, you know, with that, you know, inquisitive brain trying to figure out the next big thing so yes you have to throw money at them so they can make a mistake and figure it out again you know like you know graham bell or or, or those guys it took them a thousand tries to figure out how to make a light bulb work right so now and then um you know um the region it doesn't have enough money it's it's, it's whoever said that it's like how, name, name name 10 vcs who are real you know, how can a region of 400 million people, right, have like, you know, a dozen VCs and, and three of them actually have above 100 million? You know what I mean? There's no money in the region. Absolutely not. There's not enough. Thank God now there's, you know, uh, the, the governments are looking seriously into this. You know, you have the Saudi government, you know, creating uh, institutions to help, whether it's, you know, the, 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 the Saudi venture investment company, you know, or, or uh, Jada, the fund of funds, or Munshaat to help regulate, you know, startups and small companies. And then the same thing with, with the, the UAE, you know, ADGM and Hub71. Uh, you know, so like they're, 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 they're providing some sort of platform to help these companies, but it's never enough money. And then you said about the fake entrepreneur, right? You can't, you can't be a fake entrepreneur. You're a fake person. You know, just like there's a, a fake doctor or a fake teacher or a fake athlete. You know, you can hide. Or a fake pilot fight. now. Yeah, fake pilots, right? You, you, they, get, they got busted eventually, right? Or a fake uh, government, uh, you know, uh, employee pretending that you're taking care of business, but you're just a fraud, right? So you can't just use a fake entrepreneur. Entrepreneurs will do, you know, successful entrepreneurs win and, you know, unsuccessful entrepreneurs don't win. And as an investor, you have to be able to trust your own conviction and judgment on, on what is something that you would like and you trust, but it's an idea, 
an idea comes with a lot of challenges to make it work. And so probability wise, that might not work the first time. It doesn't make him fake. It just make him not lucky on his first try or her first attempt at whatever she wants to do. But, but to, answer, to answer your question, you got to be careful about spray and pray. You know, you can't just throw money at every stupid idea and then like, you know, coffee delivery number 50 and expect, the, you know, they're going to win. You know, people need to stop just chasing mimics and me too's and really try to find the innovation and the, uh, the, the differentiation in every opportunity. Uh, I, I want to, there's an important point that you, you just mentioned is that failure. And so in the Middle East and in the Arab region, maybe we see failure as the end of the story. And this also makes it difficult for somebody to move on and to raise more fun. In the US, not. In the Europe, the mindset is a little bit changing. But in the Middle East, if you fail, that's it. You're not getting, you're not raising money anymore. You, you, you failed in this project. Why should we give you in the second? Whereas, so we don't see it the same way. Do you think that from when you started up to today, the mindset is changing or are we still on the same path of you fail, that's it, that's done for you, go home? Right. I think it's the nature of the investor here, okay? The nature of the investor is they're risk averse. It's just the way they, they've been, right? Everyone's been making a lot of money in the past couple of decades by living in these you know, welfare GCC countries where, you know, there's no taxes, there's nothing, you get paid a lot of money. Uh, a lot of people made uh, money from uh, real estate and public equities, which seem to be consistently given out dividends, right? And so that makes them less risky because they're happy. You know, they're putting a million, getting 8% on it on a building or getting, you know, on a good year, you know, 15, 20% on a bad year, 5% in public equities. So you can't expect somebody that's doing so well to throw money at something that might not return, right? So the nature of risk averseness is, is what is the first impediment of convincing people that this is how you make money. But now that we have exits like Kareem, right, where people came in a different rounds and they have the full cycle of experience, people will become less risk averse and more, uh, you know, more encouraged to jump in, in, in the deeper end, right? And with the government leading these initiatives, you know, they will, you know, lead us in, by example, and more and more people will like that, uh, that, 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 that high risk asset class, uh, which, which is high risk, high reward too. Why else are you gonna get 400 and 500 X, right? Unless you jump into this. So in, in, in the portfolio construction, you know, family offices and ultra high net worth and sovereign wealth funds should allocate about, you know, three to five percent in growth alternative in growth private equity which is venture capital to balance out their portfolio and you know you and i talked about this earlier you know the real estate crash is coming no one has seen this happen before you know i'm gonna go on the record and say this you know since the age of the pyramids till today it's always been about real estate and location and building magnificent real estate where people will you know you know do you know just uh, revolve around it and, and, and this orbit around these great real estate places, whether it's Fifth Avenue or, or a mega mall like Dubai Mall or Avenues Mall or Champs-Élysées or Oxford Street. Those are, this is the first time in history, in history, this pandemic proved that location, location, location in real estate is no longer what's important. You know, as, you know, retail sales crash on Main Street and offline, Retail sales are going up, and Zara is a great example. When Zara shuts down 1,200 stores, especially the mega stores in great locations, and their, their, their online sales increased 30%. What does that tell you? That tells you real estate is, is no longer what you thought it was. Now, add to the fact that e-commerce is eating the, the brick and mortar retail. Now you have working from home, you know, or remote first, as it's called. When big companies like Twitter, Facebook, and Google all announced that they're going to move to a remote work environment and no longer require these mega buildings in urban cities because it's really cost, not cost effective anymore. You know, people work from home. You know, WFH and all that now is the thing. And, 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 and correlated with that is remote 
uh, enabling tech, you know, companies are, you know, whether it's, you know, Slack or Microsoft Teams or Zoom, you know, all these, all these are, you know, went up tremendously material gains and their stock price while real estate is, you know, and then of course, last but not least, the, comp the, the few stores that try to open up post the pandemic and post the retail, you know, got hit in America, for example, the Black Lives Movement and rioting and in and, and places like Boston and Germany. And so like, it just becomes such a nuisance for, for insurance and all that and to, to maintain these, these mega department stores. And so that is a reality that's gonna be facing some of these risk averse buckets where they just will learn either the, you know, by observing or by getting smashed in the head with a baseball bat when their real estate REITs are giving zero dividends and are becoming heavy on their assets, uh, you know, on, on the, on the, as a liability actually than an asset. I, see, I think when you look at the, the size that the FANG plus uh, Microsoft, the share that they have uh, of the total value of stock exchange today gives you an indication of, of what you are, you are saying. There's another point that I wanted to, to, to talk to you about. I mean, you're based in Kuwait and you've talked about initiatives in Saudi, you've talked about initiatives in Bahrain, you've talked about initiatives in the UAE. I don't hear you saying anything about Kuwait. So what is happening in Kuwait? Is Kuwait, the government in Kuwait looking to promote entrepreneurship or, or there's nothing happening? Well, I mean, you can say um, governments uh, do their best according to what they think, you know, is their priority, okay? And I'm not in the cabinet, so I don't know what they're thinking. But I know this. I know that a lot of successful entrepreneurs came out of Kuwait. And if we look at the, uh, you know, the startup ecosystem itself, you know, Talabat and Carriage, both are Kuwaiti companies. You know, I think, you know, in, in terms of other, other companies like uh, Ajar or Booker, uh, Just Clean, you know, Coded, uh, Zida, all these companies that have made an impact, you know, by uh, uh, for sale, you know, all these companies had really good markups in their fundraising and have solved problems. And especially during the pandemic, right? So these are all Kuwaiti, uh, you know, based companies and startups that were launched from here by Kuwaiti entrepreneurs. And that's a key word, Kuwaiti entrepreneurs, which means the talent is here, right? And the, 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 uh, the, the drive and the, the, the passion to make something work and solve a problem that people need exists. Now the Kuwaiti government, uh, uh, you know, the free market that we have here, you know, the sophistication of the, um, some of the, uh, some of the infrastructure that we have in Kuwait is unparalleled. You know, Kuwait to get data, you know, is the cheapest uh, than, than, than all the other GCC. You know what I mean? I think the average is, is a third of what it costs in Dubai, right? And, and a half of what costs in Saudi, just to get data. And this is one of the most important things to launch a company, right? And that is because of the free market and the fact that we have, you know, four or five telcos competing for your business here in Kuwait. And lastly, the Kuwaiti government, you know, when they launched all these, uh, the move to, 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 to an online world by digitizing, you know, barcodes, so you can go shopping in supermarkets, book your doctor appointment, go to the police station to renew your car registration all through the pandemic, you know, really gave a crash course to society into becoming a, a, a internet-based, uh, knowledge-based economy. And th that, that indirect initiatives, you know, allowed for um, more, uh, you know, excitement and, and encouragement to, to jump into uh, Kuwait. But there is no equivalent to uh, like a government fund of funds, if that's your question. And there is no equivalent to uh, something like uh, Munshaat in Saudi. Do you think there or, should be? Or, or, or what you indicate seems to say that the ecosystem without government, with less government, with less interference, finds a way at the end, a good entrepreneur will find the market, will find the people, will find the resources. So do we really need these, uh, is, is Kuwait basically a counterproof that we do not need these programs? You just mentioned a lot of, a lot of startups that have been successful. So, so how, do you, how do you evaluate that? Do you think that Kuwait needs a program like this or yeah, I think so. doing it? 
So without the government initiatives, without the Hub 71s and the Fund of Funds and you know, the Wahas and the other GCC countries, Kuwait produced so many companies. Now imagine if there's actually more direct uh, involvement for the government by, by offering you know, capital, number one, you know, if they can just do a fund of funds and uh, allow, uh, you know, investors and emerging managers to happen. Imagine they have a program where they promote angel investors. Imagine, you know, when they can allocate, you know, t you know, $2 billion, you know, to, to launch investors here, you know, to support these companies or, you know, um, pay for, you know, free coding programs for Kuwaiti and, 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 and expats that live in Kuwait. You know, so any girl can come up with her own idea of her store and she doesn't know how to launch a store, go educate her, etc. Pay to get these people educated. There's a lot of ways, but it requires a lot of money. I, I want to give you an example to answer, I think, a few of the, 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 the concerns you've raised. You know, China, a few years ago, 2017, they allocated, they spent about 400 billion, okay, that's over a third of a trillion dollars into their ecosystem. They built 1,700 incubators and like had a, you know, a joint program with they become the GP and they become the LP and, 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 and help, uh, you know, make people, investors into GPs, etc. They invested about, a tri you know, $300 billion, $380 billion into their ecosystem. There was a lot of resistance from, you know, influential people in the party when they said, there's a lot of fake entrepreneurs like you called them you know, who are going to waste money. And they said, yeah, that's true. So 30% was, was discounted as, as stupid ideas and people that are just not going to, you know, materialize into anything important. A third will be like glorified mimics, but they're fine too, because even something like Uber wasn't original. You know, even, even Kareem was not an original idea, but it's a great exit. And then the last third was going to be innovation in, in AI, in fintech, which, which really helped China leapfrog. So you have to have that expectation as a government that a lot of, you know, a third year money is gonna go wasted if you think it's a waste, but you might think it's just, you know, education so that the next tranche of, of, of innovators can learn from those mistakes. And there's, there's no shortcuts in experience, right? You need to learn from uh, making a lot of mistakes, you know, then you, then you learn. You know, it's called experience, then you do a lot of right decisions and become a wise investor or a wise operator. And so it's a cycle. You just, you know, and it's self-perpetuated and it starts with money. And so I, I want to move with, with some, some of the, the questions we've received. So somebody's saying that there's a, a new trend where VCs pump valuations to be able to justify the following rounds and that valuations are too crazy and not grounded in reality. Look, uh, fake people are everywhere, right? You can pump a stock, you know, two, two investment companies can sit and trade one public equity over and over again and cause unnecessary inflation in the market cap of that company, right? And that's fake. You know, f don't focus on the fake people. That's your job as an investor to go and invest along with people that have credibility and have demonstrated ethics. But are there stupid crooks out there? Everywhere. You can go to a bakala and someone can sell you, you know, a, a rotten piece of bread. So it's, it's, it's not about, you know, inflating a certain sector because it's, it's really inflating. And, and a case in point, both, you know, I think Carriage and uh, Kareem were, I think, were sold on the low side because they're victims of the region. You know, had they been in other parts of the world, they would have been valued much more. So it really depends mentioning, on... Mentioning uh, Kareem, we have another uh, question is that, could we have, with these large exits, the equivalent of the PayPal mafia that really reinvested and created a lot of new entrepreneurs and, and uh, uh, put that into the local startup scene? So is this something that you, you foresee that could happen in the region? Well, I mean, the PayPal mafia are just the PayPal mafia, right? There's no Snap mafia or Uber mafia or Twitter mafia, right? That was just a very distinguished team of founders that just a lot of them happened to be, you know, super investors. And because, you know, it's how old is PayPal, right? How old is PayPal? It's like, what is it, 18, 20 years old, right? So yeah, you need two decades for, for those founders to come up and, 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 and be that. So like maybe in 20 years and maybe another 15 years, you'll have the Kareem mafia, right? 
But like right now, um, right now, I think there's a lot of startups with people that came out, have a lot of encouragement as, 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 as they see Kareem lead by example, whether it's investors, whether it's companies, you know, look at the investors in Kareem themselves. You know, what did they do after? You know, the Saudi STC, right? With STV, they had a good experience with their investment in Kareem and now they want to launch, the, you know, a, a large fund, half a billion dollar fund, right? So that's an indication of, of, of what happened, you know, after the PayPal went public and how their, the team in PayPal went and started investing. So the Kareem Mafia could be STV investing, could be the next big thing they're doing. But Kareem, they're not done yet. Right? They're still doing their deals, you know, they're not fully integrated in Uber and they're still looking for other verticals. So, you know, in a few years, we will see something like that. I'm, I'm very hopeful. Uh, what about the, the VC funds and fundraising and the regulations? We have a, a, a question around this topic. I mean, do you think that at least in the GCC, there should be some marketing passporting uh, issue that would allow you to raise funds if you're a VC from all over the GCC instead of being, you know, making it a bit uh, complicated? Look, um, the Middle East is very challenging, okay? It comes with its challenges, even the GCC, right? You know, you know every country has its regulation. A lot of countries are it's fragmented, right? And, you know, just launching a company here doesn't mean you can launch it there. And so it comes with a lot of challenges and it comes with its own um, issues. But this region is also a region that has no taxes, right? So it's a tax haven anyway. And it's, it's our communication architecture. It's one of the best in the world, right? Where else are you going to go test your 5G idea? You know, look, the UK is still struggling with 5G. America is struggling with 5G. And we have 5G in Kuwait, Saudi, and the UAE. Right. So, yes, there's a lot of challenges, but there's also a lot of opportunities. Right. And a lot of things you can you can do to 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 experiment here, you know, with no taxes, with great corporate uh, communication architecture. And now with capital being poured into this region, uh, the, the, the challenges remain talent, coders, programmers. Uh, you know, if I was to, if, I, if there's a government that I can talk to and if there's a government person I can speak to, I would say, please focus on academia. Please focus on making, you know, the universities better. Please focus on, on, on investing in coding schools and coding academies and allowing for, you know, that to flourish. Without coders, without smart talent, we cannot. We cannot just attract talent here. We need to build it locally and regionally. And, you know, I, you know a lot of Arab engineers are doing very well in these startups abroad. So clearly it's not a DNA issue. You know, the DNA, you know, there's smart people here. You know, the same people can build mega buildings. I'm sure they can build anything they want if they're incentivized. And so um, I think it's, 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 it's a problem. You know, you know, the best Arab university is ranked 26 in Asia. In Asia, 26, the best Arab university. What does that tell you? You know, we're not even in top 1,000 computer science schools. You know what I mean? That's what the government should do. They should focus on that. Build, you know, build schools that teach computing. You know, Saudi Arabia did a great thing back in the days when they did the King Fed the University for Petroleum, you know? And they, they created the best engineers, the best Saudi engineers came out of that school. I remember I was with them in Boston. They were, they were you know, really good. They had solid background. And now you have Aramco, the best oil company, and Sabic and all that. But we see them. Most of the guys are... And the leadership there are Saudis. So that worked, right? So now we need to build engineering schools that teach coding and teach, uh, you know, information technology and computer science. And, you know, and I bet in a few years, you're going to have, you know, a large pool of talent, which will, you know, help this, this, this industry grow. I just want to mention that, I mean, we're, we're, we're soon to, to, to close the meeting. So we won't answer uh, specific uh, questions about uh, Ed tech and other other topics we're going to stay like uh, mainstream and we can have another discussion and dig into the different verticals available so, some uh, some other time uh, there's a question uh, that is talking about uh, not enough VCs in the later stage you know after from the seed you know this this sure. let's say from three to seven million check that is missing so how do you foresee the future 
for these these types of fundraising in the future uh, in the region that is a problem it's a good question because you know there are six stages almost in a textbook wise and then you know there's six stages to fundraising right as we said the seed angel and then you know series a and then you know the growth you know the bc and then the late stage pre-ipo that doesn't exist here you know we don't have like you know that's what i'm saying what vc has their fund three that writes checks into series c and d the 100 million dollar companies plus they don't exist but you need to grow it you know slowly you know it's like school you know like there's elementary middle school high school university masters and phd right but you need the elementary school to work for you to worry about phd because people are not going to get there right and that's the role of the government you know make you know funding these fund the funds uh, that that fund these as i said earlier you know, maybe we should start with funding angel investors and then graduates into funding series a funds and then you know late stage funds and the governments you know then by then you'll have regulations that allows for public offering and then you know th there's not enough money look israel is a small country it's in the middle east okay and it has the same challenges as the Middle East, sort of. Of course, it's not the same. We all know why. But let's say it is in the Middle East. You know, above it is Lebanon, and Syria, Jordan, Iraq, and, and Egypt. You know, and so they, you know, but, you know, they have 100 VCs. And out of the 100, there's 14 international VCs that set up shop in Israel. You know, you know how much money is poured into the ecosystem? You know how many companies come out of the ecosystem that go to America? You know, Google's uh, research center, Intel research center, it's all there. It's a population of 5 million, you know, just, if you just count the Arab Israelis and the Israelis, and then you count the Palestinians, you know, maybe all in all is a 10 million population. They have 100 VCs and 14 of the mega VCs in the world are there, you know. And so you look at India, you know, Sequoia and all those big firms are there with their emerging market funds right and looking for those deals so money is the key word here you know there's not enough money to be poured in here and if the deal flow is not sophisticated enough it will be you know what i mean but it's, you know we need more money to encourage people especially with this population of the gcc is mostly below 20 right so the ideas and the things that are going to come up are going to be endless you just need to you know ensure there's money being poured you know, consistently with long-term, you know, patience and patient capital. And of course, you know, I, I'm hopeful that the regulations will catch up and, uh, you know, banks and finance will start financing small and medium businesses. You know, once they graduate from startup to a small and medium business, they need the banks to finance them. The banks are not that friendly in the region anyway, you know, so it's a little tough. Yes. And, and so we just want to work gives an opportunity for new type of financing new type of fintechs to disrupt the banks and uh, and play this this uh, play this role i guess as well look I, this is not going to make people happy but this is the truth a lot of people here have made their money by owning big chunks in banks and big chunks of real estate both those groups are obsolete in the next five years they don't know what happened you know if they don't see this tsunami coming they're blind or they're old uh, not necessarily in age wise, they can be, you know, young people like you and I, but old in terms that are stuck in the old ways of like, you know, this is how grandma did it and grandfather did it. And they don't realize that, you know, the world changed. As you said very well, people can get loans now, micro loans from banks all over the world, right? They're not, they're not waiting for you to let them in your branch. The gatekeepers are no longer the gatekeepers. They don't realize that they've been made obsolete, completely irrelevant. And, um, and, and, you know, um, today we see a lot of trading and people are, you know, people are not focused anymore on, you know, the, the value of the asset. Does the asset change lives? Does the asset, you know, make people happier? They're all, you know, only worried about what's the next guy can pay for it. They're all day trader mentality in the, in the public markets. And the big banks are sitting there, you know, with their mega corporate loans giving the big industrial companies and big contracts, ignoring the small and medium business, while telcos are moving into micro lending and, you know, and, and giving those people money and literally eating the lunch from the big banks. 
So you see the big real estate and big banks are, you know, going down and new companies and new, you know, are going up through the online world. So people are either going to need to wake up or they're just going to disappear and be extinct, like extinct animals. I'll, I'll just uh, conclude with the final uh, question, which is, which is a mix of, of the last question that we've received is that, I mean, we are in a race against time. And so part of the question is that when you see, you mentioned China, you mentioned India, you mentioned Israel, you mentioned the US, are we too late? And to go to a question is that all that new money or more money will do in the region will create bubbles without having real smart uh, investment existing? Look, uh, the online world clearly is here to stay and the offline world is getting disrupted, you know, tremendously, especially with this pandemic, just proved how weak and, 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 and baseless the, the, the offline world is. So it's an online world going forward. And we still, you know, Andreessen Harwood said, you know, software is eating up the world and only like 2% of the world is running on software. So 98% of the world needs to be developed. So th there's so much to be done and there's so much money to be poured. And if, 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 you know, just like coffee shops, you know, there's like seven coffee shops near each other. So you wonder the fourth person and the fifth person that set up a coffee shop, how big of an idiot are they? You know, because they're just mimicking copying. The same thing is going to happen in any business. If this guy delivers and this guy delivers food and this guy, and all they do is food delivery, then, you know, you're stupid for investing on the sixth person, you know, you know, thinking they're going to do something better. You should look for innovation exactly, you know, as the white combinator says, you know, don't look for what people want, but what people need. If you continue to solve problems that people need, you continue to, you know, be relevant and, and create technologies that will be needed and therefore be valuable. And it's all about adding value to people's lives. And so once that happens, you know, you know, then, you know, money comes in and it becomes, you know, a successful uh, transaction. Great. Thank you so much for your, for your insights and for your uh, time. Uh, thank you to all uh, the attendees that uh, participated and sorry we couldn't answer all the, the questions and uh, we can uh, talk again and get more into specific uh, another time and, and talk about EdTech because there were several questions that were more, a bit more specific. Thank you so much and I will bring the session to an end now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Khaled. Thanks, man.